So we are doing point estimations for parameters and sampling distributions. Um, so relatively simple-ish. We do go over some of the random other distributions, uh, but the formulas are kind of kept to a minimum for this one. <coughs> and so outline what we're going to go over. Point estimations, central limit theorem. So I get to rant about my favorite, one of my favorite topics which is the misuse of the central limit theorem, uh, <clears throat> what point <laughs> estimation is and the different ways we do it. I get to talk about bootstrapping, which is uh, people who like uh, theory, uh, the uh, mathematical theorists will love bootstrapping because it's really kind of fun. I almost got into an argument with somebody who's um, a letters teacher over the application because they didn't understand the law of large numbers. So that'll be fun. Uh, mean square E error and kind of what it means beyond what they say here, what it actually means. Uh, and methods of moments, point estimations, we'll go a little bit over Bayesian. Uh, we'll go over uh, non-parametric tests a little bit, but uh, <clears throat> so uh, this is a concept with a little bit of formula. Um, so we see how normal distributions, as sampling distributions in the central limit theorem, how they kind of all interact. Um, if you want, on the Discord, I have about like 10 normal distribution memes, like saved up. I could drop those because they're they make me mad. Uh, so why we actually do point estimators, including bias variances and the mean square error, uh, and the different ways there to do it. So. <clears throat> a point estimate is, well, an estimate. It is a very good guess as to what we should have of a population. So X of big X1, 2, blah, 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 to 9 are random variables, which we've been over that. So <clears throat> these, the functions of these variables, X bar and S squared, are random variables called statistics. You know, we've back to the first week. Um, so we have these different distributions, which we've kind of talked about, that are called sampling distributions. So we know, given specific models, specific outcomes, more or less, what's going to happen. And we model them and we have a very good idea, you know, given if you're doing, you know, trying to think of a good example, if you're doing QC uh, on a chip line, most of your line is going to be successes, right? Very few are going to have error and higher error, error tolerances. But that's going to follow a very, very specific distribution. Different situations will have different distributions, and we like to know what those are going to look like before we even get into it so we can see if what we get from our data actually is what we have. So a point estimate of the... Population parameter theta is a single numerical value of theta hat of a statistic. The statistic, I can never remember what that symbol is. Iota. Oh, with the little eye sideways. There, I. But that is called a point estimator. So I'm just going to call it a point estimator. So, for instance, the simple one, your mean. Take all your values. Add them up, divide by the number that you have. Very, very simple. So we have, to, and this is where it kind of gets weird because you can have a sample mean and a population mean. They could be the same or different. You can also have a sample within your population. So if you, for instance, if you have I kind of did this for you guys. So when I, remember how I told you I was going to do a, a test to see if you're significantly different from Thursday's class? So I took a sample from you, a sample from them, and compared them. By the way, you guys on average scored higher. So, yay. Um, <clears throat> but there are different ways to express these at the same time. So let's make this slide as hard for you to see as possible. Uh, this is why I'm kind of glad you have it because um, so the mean 
uh, if mu is a of a single population. So if you have a population, we can just calculate the mean of that population. And that's given by the symbol right here. The variance, sigma squared, of a, or the standard deviation of a single population, we, we've used this before. Proportion is given by small p or pi of items in a population that belong to a class of interest. So right now, you guys are being inundated by political ads and all that. And if you're like me, you want to see what everything is. And we always look at proportions when you do like voting. And those are given by P. So the difference of two population is you subtract the mean of two populations. When you try to find the difference of those populations, you just subtract um, of the, the proportions rather, you just subtract the proportions. So if like if you're following Prop 208, you can see the number of people who voted pro Prop 208 and, or who polling pro versus anti 208, you could see the difference in those numbers. And then you look at the, you know, the margin of error and see how close it actually is. That's kind of some of the stuff you do. So for our mean of, a simp of the population, we have that is X bar for the sample mean. So these are used, the, this and this are essentially used interchangeably. Um, for our variance of the estimator uh, is equal to S squared. So the sample variance is more or less equal to the population variance. The P for the estimate of P bar is equal to X over N and the sample population where X is the number of items in the size of N that belongs to the what you're looking at. So we can figure out the proportion based off of um, how many successes we have out of our total hunt, total population. Uh, you know, how we find proportions in general. How many successes we have out of 100? What's your grade out of, you know, was it 405 we're at right now? That's your, that's your proportion. Your success is out of your total. Um, so when we're looking at the mean difference, we could use the estimator of the difference hats is equal to the means hats, or the mean x bar one minus x bar two. So we can look at the difference of the sample means or the population means, and they should be more or less the same. And same thing with the p bar or the p. So p bar or sorry p hat. It should be close to the populations themselves, proportions themselves. So those basically out of all this nonsense and all my rambling, what you need to know is essentially that when you look at a sampling, they should be ideally a representation of your population. So the variance, standard deviation, means proportion, mean difference, proportion differences should all be representative and the same, pretty close to the same of what you get from a population at whole if your life is good. If it isn't, you have to look at that and there's all kinds of tests. And if you want to know, I can tell you what they are. Not now, because we don't really go into them later. There's ways you can tell if what you have should be what you get. Like chi squared and likelihood ratios and all kinds of nonsense. So, do do what you got all of those. <clears throat> so wonderful definition. So if a random variables, the X's are a random sample of N if the X's are independently ran, uh, random variables. So you're choosing something to sample independently. That's always important. And if every X value has the same probability distribution, you have to have the same likelihood of pulling each X and have the that uh, they be random. So you can't play with marked cards. You can't play with hot dice, you can't do anything that changes either the fact that they're independent or the fact that they're randomly distributed. <clears throat> Those are important for randomness because a lot of the times people will either on purpose or inadvertently change those and it affects everything, all your outcomes. So once again, back to 200 level, a statistic is a function of the observations in a random sample. So we pull a sample, we do math to it, and that's a statistic. 
So when we take the mean of a sample, that's a statistic. And our probability distribution of that statistic is called a sampling distribution. So whenever we take that data, bring it in and run it through and see our results, we can look at how it varies over you know, the standard norm or whichever one we're looking at from, uh, from zero to your top end, see how, you know, how often we get all these results, that would be our distribution for our sample. So this brings us to one of my favorite whipping horses, the central limit theorem. So they don't tell you some things here for this. And it's not gonna let me draw, is it? Really? So for this, I don't know why it doesn't let me draw. Um, central limit theorem is nice and all, but the idea of central limit theorem is essentially the the, the not law or the um, law of large numbers. If I have a large enough population, if the sample that I pull from that population is not normal, I can assume it is normal if there's a large enough population for me to draw from. I can essentially resample and get a normal. The issue for this. You have to have at least 20. People don't. People pull rank this central limit theorem without meeting the qualifications for central limit theorem, which they don't even talk about here. But the idea of central limit theorem is that we can take everything and bring it back to, of course, you go backwards to not the highlighter, this formula right here, the z score. So central limit theorem applies to a normal distribution and it applies to a normal distribution. So with the mean being zero and standard deviation of one. So remember that thing from a couple chapters ago, you have normal distribution, your Z score is essentially your deviation from that, the 50% mark. And as you go up and down, you can change your value. So like I said, they kind of really didn't do a lot about it because if you apply this, you generally have enough. But the issue is a lot of people are applying it and applying it wrongly that people get really annoyed with it, like I do. So an example of this, If you have a random variable X with a continuous uniform distribution, this one up here. So from four to six, you're always going to be at 50%. <clears throat> Otherwise you have nothing. To find the distribution of the sample mean of the random sample for size of N40. So they meet that, which we didn't even talk about. Uh, the mean and variance of X are going to be five because that's what we get if we apply the uniform distribution value, right? And the standard deviation will be 6 minus 4 squared over 12, so a third. So we get that distribution right here. <clears throat> so the central limit theorem indicates that the distribution right here is approximately normal with a mean, they did this wrong, of 5 and a variance of, so that's, we have sigma squared over n, so 1 over 3 times 40 or 100, 1 over 120. So we can calculate the standard deviation, we know the mean, and we can see the distributions. So the idea of central limit theorem is if I have a large enough sample space, the mean of this uniform will be the mean of what I get here. And depending on how big your number is here, will determine essentially how wide you are. So the, the bigger your sample size, the closer you're going to be to that mean and the larger your peak will be. The smaller your sample size, the more stretched out it's gonna be and the more closer you're gonna to be to the uniform distribution. So 
one of the reasons why when you look at this, you have a size of 20. So if you have a size of 20, you're gonna have something really close to a normal distribution. Anything more than that, and you're gonna start flattening out and it's gonna start looking more and more uniform. And that's where you have the issues. And so like mathematically, that's where the idea comes from. If I have a big enough population, I have a uniform distribution, equal chance of getting it, I should have, if the sample is correct, a normal distribution, more or less at the middle. Can you tell I know the subject way a lot more than the other stuff? But like I said, this gets abused a lot. So if you have to use it, make sure you use it appropriately. Otherwise, it's going to be giggo. You're going to have garbage in, garbage out. If you're not doing it correctly, it doesn't matter what your results are you're still gonna have issues with the results because they're not gonna be valid. And that's important when you're making decisions to have valid information to do it on. <clears throat> so, to approximate the sampling distribution of a different uh, difference in sample means, you take the difference of the so you do if you have two independent populations u1 u2 and you have means and ones and twos you take the difference of the means and of the mu's and put them over the square root of the variance over uh, n of one plus the variance of two over n2 that's all you do it's kind of annoying um, but this can be easily kind of coded <coughs> So this is the sampling distribution. So this will give you the z-score, which is this part over here. It will give you where you are along the distribution so you can make decisions on whether or not what you're getting from this difference will be different than what you expect. Does anyone need a quick refresher on the z-scores on how you actually do that on the tables? There, so you do need a re quick refresher? Okay, since I'm drinking tea and no one's within six feet of me. So on those, let me go over here. So if I have a Z table. So there's actually a web page called ztable.com that has all this. <coughs> so on this, so you can do the math real quick on this, right? Uh, so if you do the math on this, you get your, your X1, X2, mu1, mu2, and all this. You do it, you crank, plug it, and you get a number, let's call it 1.72 or negative 2.38. Doesn't matter. Because you do the math, you get the number. What in the world do I do with this number? Because you have no idea. This is what you do. So this is ztable.com. Do I is it gonna let me do this? Really? Okay. So what you do is on here this will tell you what percentage of your table or of your distribution you're in so the first two numbers will be on your left here and your third number so let's do three four zero will be on your right or on the top <clears throat> so if i had that one point then this is put into negative here which is your left side of the, the table so it's over here there's negative this is positive so negative positive if i am say that 1.76 so if i'm at 1.76 i go 1.7 here and then i go over to six you could do it's really hard to do this from over here and i get what is it 0.9608 Oh, that Z score, that point, which is the difference in this case, from here would put me at 96% to the left of me and 3.92 to the right of me. So that Z score, the difference I have between the two means in this point would put me so that 96% would have a smaller difference than what I calculated. What this means for you eventually is we're going to end up doing something called t-test or, or p-test. This is your t or p-test. 
this are p-value. This is your probability that events occurring will be less than you or greater than you. And then you have like type one and type two. <clears throat> but the idea is you look at the table, you put that z-score in, and that will tell you where you are on this table, on this, on this graph. And once you have that, you can figure out base percentages. So instead of doing the normal distribution where you had 65, 95, and 99.75. You can have a very precise location and you don't have to estimate. And you do it by just looking up your Z score from the math you did. That help? One of those easy things that if you've never done, you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Which is okay, because, you know. As with anything else, once you learn it, it's easy. So, you can have biased and unbiased estimators. So, a bias of an, uh, the point estimate uh, is an unbiased estimator of the parameter if your expected point estimator is equal to, uh, sorry, sigma, and the estimator is not unbiased if it is equal to negative sigma. Uh, it is called bias of, uh, this is called the bias of the estimator, what was it, iota? I can't remember what it is, this signal, uh, point estimator. When the estimator is unbiased, the bias is zero, and so the expected value of that minus theta will be zero. So basically, theta um, is what we look at as our bias. And we like to essentially have an un, uh, as unbiased as possible usually because we like to know true values. But sometimes you do put biases on things because you know you're gonna, it's going to go one way or the other. It just depends on what model you want to build. So if we have a random variable with set mean and variance, and we have random samples of a size of n from the population, we can do random math to find values. So our expected value of our mean is just adding all the random variables, dividing by that number. Easy enough, which is all, <clears throat> which is what all this is. I, they make this more complicated than it has to be. I don't understand why. Um, but you add up all your values, divide by your n. That's all it is. Um, when you look at the variance, you do the summation of your x values minus your mean of your x and take that over n minus one. Once again, they make this a lot more complicated and I don't know why. So this formula right here is essentially all you need. This is just them deriving it to make it slightly different. It's up to you how you wanna do it, but I usually do the KISS method, which is the first one to me. So, the last one over here is the, what is it? Oh, this is just a continuing here. So the sample variance S squared is an unbiased estimator of the population variance. So your sample variance is an unbiased estimator. It's all this is proving. So this is your, S this is just literally the same thing over again, isn't it? So this is just the, um, completely derived formula of this part over here. But once again, I end up just using that one. It doesn't make sense to do all that extra math because I usually set up a spreadsheet to do all this for me. Um, if you want to set up a spreadsheet for this, by the way, it is very, very simple because it's, I mean, if I have, you don't need to see people's screen. So if I have over here, uh, value equals ran between two, one, and 50. I don't even know how many I have. One values, yeah, one values. No difference. So, equals average A to So 
we just take this times this. Dollar sign a dollar sign nineteen squared. And then you will so to the equation, double check the equation is correct. So you can take that, sum them up. Um, B2, B2, B16, and then S squared equals this. What if I count of these? Minus one. And there we have our S squared. If you want to find S, you just take it equals square root S square root of this value. So same thing. Really quick, really easy, white white derive formulas. That's always been my thing. Okay. <clears throat> so anywho. So the minimum variance unbiased estimator. So if we consider all unbiased estimators of, of my brain just went dead, theta for one of the smallest values is called the minimum variance unbiased estimator. So if we have n x values in a random sample of size n from a normal distribution with a known mean and variance, the sample mean is the MVUE. So, In English, that means our mean for any normal distribution should be the minimum unbiased estimator or minimum variance unbiased estimator because there's a chance that you have a variance of zero. Not likely, but possible, but that's the smallest variance you can have. <clears throat> and this gives us standard error. So this is where you have a lot of things that go into different fields like um, like genetics uses this heavily. A lot of things that look at this uh, uses this variable as something that's really important within it. Because if you know the standard error, you can see how much um, data comes from very specific parts of your model, which we'll get to those later. So the standard S Error of the estimator of this symbol here is the standard deviation given by uh, the square root of the variance of that standard error hat. Uh, so if the standard error involves unknown parameters that we can estimate, the substitution of those values into here produces a estimated standard error, noted by that symbol. <clears throat> so what this means is we can take the variance of those standard estimators so if we have a variance in a population based on a specific parameter, we could see how much the standard deviation, the, the, the mean and the distribution is affected by that one thing. Doesn't make a lot of sense right here, but when you start looking at three or four things interacting within each other to alter how a model works, this lets you see why things vary from your set point. And when you get to, um, there is, I don't know if we get to it, but there is a little bit of diffy Q in here, but if we do get to it, you won't do the math, uh, that looks at the variance within individual number sets and see which one's important within the data. Uh, those are actually, if you actually have to deal with a lot of numbers, really important because they let you see what numbers are, or what variables are important unbiasedly so that you can filter out a lot of things that don't make sense before you take it to anyone to look at, <clears throat> which is really kind of cool because it takes a lot of effort out of your hands in like five clicks, which is always nice. Uh, so the standard deviation, uh, so suppose if we are, have a, a normal distribution with a mean and a variance given, and the distribution of X bar is normal with a mean and a variance given of uh, standard, uh, the variance or standard deviation over N, 
So there's a standard error of X is this formula right here. So we can find, this is the standard error of your X variable, which if I was mean and callous, you'd have to calculate by hand on a test, but I'm not gonna do that. It's what my um, professor had to do in grad school. I did not like it because like it, I'm like, you look at this formula once, now remember it for midterm. Um, if we did not know the standard deviation and instead use the sta uh, sample standard deviation, we would use that formula. It would be the standard error of X bar instead of, uh, the, it would be an estimated one, SE, instead of our known. So if we don't know the standard deviation, we can use the population standard deviation in its, our variance in its stead. Which is good. You just it's an estimator instead of the actual. That's all. So these are formulas. Like these are really easy to use formulas. So. Um, so if you have <coughs> ten measurements of thermal conductivity from iron, uh, given at these given points, we can find the mean by adding them all together and dividing it by ten. Easy enough, right? Because we don't know the standard deviation or the, or the variance, you can replace uh, with the standard deviation of 0.284 of S to obtain the estimated standard error. So it would just be 2.284 over the square root of 10. Because we can calculate that, but we don't have this value. Because you can just do the math to find this value. Same way you just take the the difference between this X bar and each individual square it over nine. And it would give you 0.284. <coughs> oh, wait, square root of that. Sorry. So what this tells us is about two so the standard error is about two percent, point two percent of the sample mean. So if you look at this and this, that's about 0.2 percent. So if you are at that small of a thing, then this right here will be a very, very close estimation of where the actual true mean is. The standard error is essentially a measurement of how close this value is to what it should be. Because remember, this is just what we get from a sampling. This is not what we get from the actual population, from the population, this is what we get from the sample. And this is a way we can estimate how accurate this is to what it actually should be in a large population. Because we're not gonna sample every bit of uh, iron for thermal conductivity because no one has that much time. And people will yell at you for taking that much time. So you just take a normal standard sampling. My only problem with this is, once again, sample time. Once again, like I said, people do it all the time and it bugs me. But the issue is they can draw a larger sample size. So I'm less annoyed than if they couldn't. <clears throat> this leads us to bootstrapping. This is what you do if you can't draw a large sample. So bootstrapping is basically when you have a distribution, you can't go out and sample it over and over and over again. So you take what you have and you simulate it. <clears throat> so these usually use exponential or uh, Weibo distribution. I've done it on normal, I've done it on pair match, uh, 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 Poisson distribution. I've done these under a ton of distributions. You can do it under anything, but they tend to be done on non-normal because Otherwise, you do central limit, you're usually fine. But you need computers. Um, these, uh, the quickest one I've done took about 10 seconds. The longest one I did, I stopped because it was over a week long and I wanted my computer back. This depends on your data set. The, that one was uh, a QTL population. So you had a couple billion simulations and I just wanted my computer back essentially because I only had four gigs running on it for the program. <clears throat> but what you do is you run thousands upon thousands of simulation of your data. You get that out and you kind of combine them all together and you get 
a good estimation of what you should get. Um, somewhere, I might pull up a video of it and put it up later. I have a very good uh, demonstration of what happens whenever you bootstrap something. It has to do with um, rolling dice, two, rolling two dice, and how close you'll get to running. If not, I can make it. It's kind of a cool thing. And how close you get to actually rolling a seven. Because if you see it between a two and a 12, seven should be the most common number because it's in the middle of the dice. You have two of them. But the smaller sample you get, the more towards a uniform you are, but the larger sample, the more you bootstrap, the more it goes up, the more it actually reaches that peak. And it's really interesting when, when you do bootstrapping, because if you do more and more simulations up to the, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, millions, you get more and more. And it's a way to do what this does to get that true mean on something that I'm not going to sit around and roll dice 10 million times. I just know, uh, but I could show what happens because it should do this given known probabilities and I could show that. Um, so it, you have the same formulas, just different letters around it. So you have the same known mean, same known standard error, you run the same calculations to get the same values. You just have different things around it. The difference is you do them hundreds if not thousands of times why you run the run on the computer. Um, if you have limiting population size, this is what you do with them. If I know more or less, I get this kind of data out of it. This is what I've got historically. <clears throat> or if I've done like two or three seasons and this is like the proportions that I get in each one, you can run bootstrap to actually be confident of what you're getting, if, is it actually what I should be getting. So for instance, I could only think of ecology because ecologists use this all the time. If I know, for instance, uh, anybody like fishing? So if you go out salmon fishing, you know more or less how many salmon you should get when, they, when they're spawning, right? Because they have a very good idea because they follow those numbers for health of the population. If I am an ecologist and I'm out there looking at the salmon numbers this year, or what I am getting this year, representative to what I get normally. I have very good data on what I should get, but I'm not too sure about this year's because it's 2020 and who knows what's going on this year, right? So I take that, all the data I have, and I run simulations on what I get and when I get it to see if over 10 or 20,000 times that I run these data, do I get what I've gotten in the past? And there's all kinds of weird tests and if you really are interested in it i have a my professor i learned stats under literally made one for his grad work which was weird <clears throat> how do you make a test for a phd anywho the mean square error of an estimator um, is equal to the variance of the estimator plus the squared bias <coughs> so we've already done the estimator you just square the estimator so that the iota minus theta quantity squared. That expected value of your estimator. Um, so you could rewrite it as your variance of the estimator plus your bias squared. <coughs> this is what times the math they do is a little easier than the math up here. Uh, so the relative efficiency of two points can be measured by uh, looking at the error between those two points. So if you find the mean square error of the first point and the mean square error of the second point, just divide them and it gives you the relative efficiency of this. Uh, if that's less than one, we conclude the first estimator uh, is a more efficient estimator than the second estimator because it has a smaller error. If it's more than one, the second would be better than the first because it has a smaller estimator. <coughs> because you want to have essentially as close to zero as you can get. Because you want that mean square error to be really close most times. As with everything in statistics, everything is relative. So yes, 
the mean square error in this case is I want to be really close to the mean. However, if I'm looking for something that has to be bigger or smaller than that mean, like if I'm if I'm running a test, if I'm wanting to find something significantly different, I want this to be massive. I want a really, really big number for my mean square error because that would mean what I observed in this point is a really big difference from that zero point of, of a Z of zero. Because that tells me that what I have, what I'm looking for is different than what I'm expecting to get. Um, so an estimator has a mean squared error that's less than equal to a mean squared error of the other estimator for all values. The estimator is called an optimal operator. Optimal operator, they don't exist. I know it says that rarely exists. I have never seen one. I've never seen one where these essentially are equal, less than or equal to the mean square error. It, it just never happens. So how we do point estimation, even though we've kind of already done them, I guess, but we have different methods to do them. <clears throat> so and the general idea behind the method of moments is to make a population moments. So we do it based off populations, uh, which is done based on expected values, based on sample moments, yes. Oh, we're not covering 7.4? If we're not, then I will gladly not do this. Let me double check. Oh, wait, that's in my Gmail. I will find out, and if not, thank you, because Point estimators are kind of wonky. Oh, wrong email. Um, come on. So seven, uh, give us. I would be okay with this because some of these are not too fun. That would be actually the rest of it. So, um, okay, yep. So that's essentially what we had for today. Unless you really want me to go over likelihood estimators, which are, honestly, we've already kind of done them. It's the same thing over again with different formulas. Um, so fine, I'm okay with that. I'm sure everyone else's brains like, I don't want to do any more of this late in the evening. So uh, really quick, so the DQ, which hasn't been posted yet, I'll double check, is to make a script. I don't care if it's MATLAB or anything else to you what you want to do. Uh, that computes confidence intervals and confidence bounds for each of the Z distributions and T distributions for given parameters or statistical values. Use it to work out and confirm results of the problem for homework five and from lecture notes. Uh, so yeah, that's what we're doing. So what we're doing is confidence intervals are, I don't have it up there with uh, Rachel. Oh, fine. <clears throat> and they're usually done as very specific confidence intervals, but that depends on what you So if I have a known mean right here, confidence interval is I have ninety five percent confidence that the true mean of my sample lies between this score and that score. This can be done as either a z-score or a t-score, but usually a deviates from this mean. So because it deviates from a z-score and a t-score both of them are small, so these negative two confidence numbers usually. Um, so mm, this is not that 
this is kind of one of the struggles on the big store kind of because it's a little confusing what the options are. So we kind of saw that and we were aware that now we can find like an answer and look at the difference between our X bar value and the true mean, right? What the 95% confidence interval is, we are 95% confident in that we're just changing two values. So, looking at the error, looking at everything else, what value we're getting here for these points is not correct. Um, let me stop this.